Okay. So, uh, welcome to the uh, July, July 9th, uh, 2010 meeting of the Ottawa Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, next uh, slide, please, Chris. Uh, tonight we've got a fairly full program for you. Uh, we're hoping we can get through it all in the amount of time we've got. Uh, talk by Rolf Meyer on observatories, uh, something on astrophotography, technique and equipment by Sanjeev uh, Sivril Rasa. Uh, Al Scott will do the usual 10-minute astronomy news. We've got a couple of certificates to deliver. Deborah's going to talk to us a bit about the GA and show us some slides. And Chuck has got something on crater identification as well. So uh, getting right into it. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to uh, first of all ask, do we have any people uh, here tonight who are here for the first time? Oh, gee, it's very rare that we see that. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't require people to be members of the society uh, to attend the meetings and uh, attend star parties, that sort of thing. We're uh, more than happy to have people come out. But nevertheless, from time to time, we do have to kind of tend to the, uh, the membership overall. You know, we're stronger as a group than we are as individuals. And that uh, certainly applies to this center and the society as a whole. You know, uh, uh, having numbers as far as membership goes uh, is, uh, is a good thing overall. It increases our influence both locally and uh, nationally. Uh, for policies uh, such as, you know, dark sky initiatives and uh, uh, various uh, educational things that are, that are done throughout the country. Um, so what am I talking about? Basically, um, we would like to encourage uh, any who are not members of the society right now to uh, join. And so uh, the slide here is just to bring up some things that we often forget about, the ben benefits of membership. So uh, just looking across it for a moment here, um, you know, it's divided on the left into in Ottawa, in other words, you know, locally at the center and also uh, the benefits nationally uh, that you get out of membership. I'm, I'm not going to read all this stuff to you, you know, I'm sure most of you can read and those who can't don't really want me to point it out anyway. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, there are some, uh, some great things that come out of membership. Uh, you know, publications, there's some very good publications. Of course, we get uh, the Astronauts, uh, which is produced by the Center itself. And as well, uh, we get a subscription free to Sky News. Uh, there's a certain dollar value associated with that. It's a very good publication. Both of them are very good and uh, very uh, pertinent to the things we're interested in. Uh, the Observer's Handbook is a wonderful thing. It's produced every year. Of course, most of the people here get one every year, so they know all about them. But uh, full of useful information, informative articles, very, very useful at the telescope or at the desk at home. Um, and as I say, I won't go through all the rest, but there's a lot of really good programs. So uh, for those of you who are not uh, members at this time, I'd encourage you to uh, take a look at it anyway. Uh, you know, it is, uh, it is kind of a good thing, and overall you'll be contributing to the center's strength and our ability to uh, influence what's going on in this country with respect to astronomy. Um, if you do uh, develop an interest, if you do want to take a look at membership, uh, we don't keep uh, membership information here in the center. Uh, what I'd advise you to do is go to the National RESC uh, website. Uh, just look for resc.ca and uh, you'll find right off the front page there, there'll be a link that'll take you to membership info. You can look at it and think about whether it seems worthwhile to you. I'd encourage you to do so anyway. So enough on that. We'll carry on here. How much is the membership? I don't remember to tell you the truth. I is it 67 now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's gotten a bit more expensive in the last year or so. Uh, I think there was some changes to national policy that, that brought that about, but it, uh, it stayed stable for quite a long time. Okay, any other questions on that? No? Nope. Uh, pardon me? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, so if you have any questions and want to talk to anyone about it, you can see Art Fraser. Um, I doubt very much whether he's wearing a heavy sweater with a Saturn on it tonight, 
but normally uh, he can be identified by that. Uh, he'll uh, be outside uh, to do with the uh, refreshments at the break time. So uh, he takes care of membership, and he'll be the person that you go to to get your membership card should you decide to become a member. Okay? Good. Uh, so next on the list here, Ottawa members in the news. You, you might remember we had a couple last time, and... Uh, uh, surprise, surprise, we have yet more this time. So the center's membership is getting a lot of uh, press these days. So first of all, Peter Cervolo, uh, uh, nice review of the uh, Cervolo 300 astrograph. It's very complimentary. Uh, you might be uh, interested in reading that. Uh, next after that, Glenn LeDrew uh, has an article in Sky News to do with O and B class star associations in the uh, constellation Scorpius. Uh, next, uh, Stephen McIntyre has got a photo of the Leo trio uh, in, uh, in the same issue. So I encourage you to uh, go ahead and take a look at those issues. Uh, we take a certain pride in when uh, our members uh, succeed in getting into the news or the publications like this. And I'd, I'd encourage them, well done. Uh, Right. With that, I guess uh, we'll jump right into the first talk of the evening, which is Rolf Meyer, uh, who's going to uh, talk to us about observatories. So just a personal note, of all the uh, members whose uh, places I've visited from time to time, Rolf has definitely got the most observatories. He has a, he has a property covered with observatories. So he's very, uh, very much an authority on the topic, and I think he's got some good things to say to you about them. Welcome, Rolf. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, four observatories ranging from fairly simple to uh, rather more complex. And of course, we can't read this right now, so uh, there we go. So, um, so the criteria that might go into building an observatory, I think the primary one, uh, the primary, uh, say the first three are probably the most important, protecting the telescopes from uh, the weather when they're not in use, and uh, keeping them at the temperature of the outside so that you don't bring them um, out from the uh, uh, from inside where they have to adapt to the temperature uh, and hopefully the telescopes are ready to use a lot faster uh, and if the observatory is well designed you can uh, hopefully get protection from the wind and shielding from external lights uh, you want to keep the telescopes clean and dry not just protected from the weather because Invariably, dust and stuff blows in, uh, and moisture can get in even if you try and protect it from the weather. Uh, you have a place to store things, uh, like your cameras and eyepieces. Uh, keeping out bugs, um, not just necessarily when, uh, it's, uh, when you're observing, but also after you put everything away, uh, bugs seem to get into things. Keeping out rodents, like, like little mice are very hard to keep out. Uh, and you want to free up some space in the house because other people in the house might not like all your telescope stuff lying around. <laughs> and then when you have visitors, you know, you have a place where they can congregate and, and look through your telescope. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully the whole thing will end up being really low cost. So this is my first observatory. <laughs> Uh, We're often judged on that list. But it, <laughs> the score is high on half. So it's not, it's not one of the four uh, because this one melted. <laughs> uh, but it was... It's one hot telescope, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, this was effective in keeping out uh, the wind and uh, lights, which was, uh, you know, in the, in the winter, uh, keeping out the wind is a, is a ma major factor. Uh, no bugs. Didn't, yeah. Um, now, uh, this is another, this is not an observatory, but this is kind of an alternative to an observatory. Just cover the telescope outside with a tarp. Uh, and that's sort of okay, but after a while, it, uh, you, you really want something better. But this, you know, I mean, uh, I think I've done this for like a year with uh, telescopes. But invariably, uh, you know, things will deteriorate if you keep it just under a tarp for too long. Okay, so this is, this is the simplest uh, type of... Uh, you might argue whether it's an observatory or not, but this is a very simple way to achieve a lot of the goals that I listed at the outset. And this is just a, a roll-off cover for the observatory, or for the telescope. 
And you see it just rolls off and there's the telescope ready to use right away. That's it. I won't describe how to build it. You can see the concept there and uh, it's pretty straightforward. The next uh, very simple concept is a rollout telescope. So uh, in the day it looks like a, a garden variety garden shed and uh, it, it looks like any old garden shed that you'd buy say at Canadian Tire. And then you open the doors and you can roll out the telescope. Now uh, it rolls out. Now it, it, being on wheels of course is not very good so you want to have some kind of method of uh, uh, making it a little more solid and uh, uh, for example, this is the kind of approach that Bob Olson uses. He has some marks on the ground, uh, some holes actually where the telescope uh, slides in so you have your uh, um, accurate polar alignment uh, that you've previously set out. Now, uh, one thing I should say here, I'll say it in this picture, is that um, uh, you know, you don't have to go crazy with digging foundations and uh, uh, making piers. Uh, and um, uh, getting in the concrete trucks and all that. Uh, only one of, the f one of the four that I am showing here will have that feature. Uh, for most uh, little observatories that you can build, it's perfectly adequate to have um, a, a level area uh, covered with, say, these uh, cement uh, patio stones. And that, that's, that's pretty good. And uh, uh, you'll, you know, I'll, I'll make the argument later that, that that's pretty good in maintaining polar alignment for most uh, applications as well. Again, I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but you can see that there's some uh, opportunity for storage in there as well, for putting in shelves that they, they come with. Um, and uh, it's, again, pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, next in complexity is we have the roll-off roof, which is the kind of observatories, probably the most common kind. So spend a little bit of time on, on that. Uh, this particular one, uh, in the spirit of keeping it low cost, I made with a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, materials that were lying around uh, in, the, uh, in, in the area. So uh, one thing I used was uh, garage doors and uh, the garage door hardware because we got new garage doors and the the old the old doors are whoops so that's not what I meant to show yet but uh, well it doesn't matter we, well I'll keep it here <laughs> so uh, the uh, the roof is actually the garage doors the garage door panels and uh, uh, the um, the parts that uh, the roof slides on are the uh, you know, the, the rails that the, the garage door normally would slide on. Uh, and the, 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 the observatory itself is just a simple wood frame with uh, plywood or, or aspenite to hold it together and uh, covered with, uh, with uh, vinyl siding, which is extremely cheap. There's probably only about $60 worth of uh, vinyl siding there. I mean, you'd... you'd Probably not. Once you see how it goes together, uh, you'd be shocked at uh, uh, you know that they would build houses using this stuff. But it's extremely cheap and simple. Uh, so you wonder why houses are so expensive because it's, it's really it's nothing to put this on. And some uh, this is actually just some fiberglass panels that I had lying around. Uh, and it opens fairly easily. The roof uh, slides off with. Um, uh, great ease along these um, uh, rails that are that the garage door will will normally meant to slide on. Now, it, what I found is that what's very good to cover the scope is a, a shower curtain. Uh, it's good to keep it dry. Despite the observatory, you still want to put something else over the telescope because what happens is if you don't use it for a few weeks or uh, over the course of a year, it's going to get really dusty and you're going to get uh, little bits of debris falling on it and invariably uh, moisture will fall off the roof through condensation. So just put something else on it. And a shower curtain is good because uh, they're often, uh, well, they're waterproof. But, but don't, don't get the really cheap um, uh, shower curtains. I got a really cheap one for, it was less than $10, but it, it just cracked in the, in the cold. So get kind of the next one up, which is more like a cloth material. 
Okay, and now inside, uh, you've got uh, room for storage, you know, a, a small table, a chair. Um, I put another uh, uh, cover over the camera itself. Uh, so this is a, a freezer bag which goes uh, over the camera as just another layer of protection to help keep out bugs and moisture. Uh, and a small, small cabinet. Now, it, again, this whole thing rests on uh, patio stones. So there's a, there's a gravel base. I excavated the, the grass, basically, uh, got down to uh, some more solid soil, put down some gravel, put down some patio stones on top of that, and uh, the, uh, the, the tripod sits on that. Uh, and over the course of the year, I find very little change in the polar alignment. So um, really, if you, unless you think you really, really need some good polar alignment, I, I wouldn't bother with a foundation and a pier, even for a permanent observatory, because this, this is still relatively portable. Um, uh, because today with auto guiders and um, uh, relatively short exposures and polar alignment scopes, uh, I, I would still make the argument that you don't really need a, a permanent pier. Um, now, again, uh, on the question of simplicity, I was going to you know, make, dig a hole and put in the posts that hold this up. Uh, so temporarily, I just had these posts uh, sitting on, on the ground with um, uh, stones to kind of spread out the weight. And quite honestly, I think that's all you need. Uh, I don't think you need to go to the trouble of, of burying these posts and uh, digging a hole for them. Um, this way you can change the position slightly if, uh, if, if the building moves or if, if things warp a little bit. But if they were permanently in the ground, boy, things would, things would really start to get askew. So again, I, I think it's perfectly adequate to have, have these things just sitting on the ground. Uh, the roof is going to come apart unless you do something. So this one, uh, basically there is a turnbuckle here to hold the roof together. And there's a little bit of uh, adjustment there to keep it um, uh, just the right distance apart to match the, the rails. Because it is kind of critical for the wheels to, to stay in the rail to have it moving uh, smoothly. And there's a view of these, of the rails. And uh, the, uh, uh, I think there's six, six wheels per side. So the amount of weight on each, each wheel is relatively small, like uh, about 30 pounds. So they don't, uh, they don't have to be particularly strong if you use a lot of wheels. Um, these are nylon wheels in a, in a metal railing, so that, that gives you very low friction. Um, and don't, don't even bother trying with like rubber casters and, and wood, because that's going to give you a lot of friction. And there, there's a, there's a close-up of one. And you can see that there's, um, uh, you know, some room for adjustment there. You've got a number of holes. So uh, garage doors, you know, are, in, are installed very, very roughly, uh, meant to be installed with relatively unskilled labor. So, you know, you've got this, all this adjustment that you can make uh, afterwards to get it working smoothly. Uh, and uh, I think uh, something else very important is it's just going to sit there uh, and you're going to be leaving it for long periods of time. One day a wind is going to come along that is strong enough to blow the roof off. So, so put a pin or something in there to keep the, the roof from blowing off when, when the wind does get strong enough. Uh, okay, and I just want to make the point also that you can build this in the winter. So I built this here in, in the winter. Uh, on a nice day, it's, it's really no problem. I didn't like where it was situated. There were too many trees. So in the summer, I put it all on a, on a truck and, and I moved it. Uh, so there's that, that's why I got those other pictures there. So don't worry about uh, even, even winter construction is, is doable. Okay, and finally, there's the, the dome. And this is the, the more sophisticated um, structure. Uh, most work, the most expensive, and so on. Uh, and it opens up the, uh, 
So there's a slit that, that, that moves up, uh, and uh, at the bottom there's a door, because you can't make the, the slit a full 90 degrees, so, so the easiest thing is to have uh, uh, the slit cover most of it, and then when it goes off, uh, just have a little bit more to get the... Th this part here may be only uh, less than half the time you'd have to open this, because this is only for looking at things low. <laughs> Uh, and again, this one, this one does have a permanent pier, um, and that's also for, you know, aesthetics. And so where do you get it? Where do you get the, uh, the dome? You get the dome at the dome dealer. Um, <laughs> interestingly, they've also discovered that you can use these for silos. Um, so, um, so maybe you'd see them advertised as a, as a silo dealer. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. This, this, was, this was an Embrun. This particular one was an Embrun, which is the <laughs> silo dealer for all of eastern Ontario. Because uh, they don't, don't seem to make these anymore. So, um, uh, basically, uh, we got this, uh, this used dome. Uh, the smallest silo, pretty much, is a 12-foot one, which is uh, what this, this one is. And um, uh, it's small enough to move. and. Uh, the a used one was it was about four hundred dollars at the time, and so when you get it home, it's uh, basically a bunch of panels like this, and you uh, bolt them together, and you get your dome. Uh, yes, yeah, so you do have to kind of make a, a an opening for the slit, uh, and again we use the familiar um, garage door hardware for the the rails. Okay, and they've uh, made these so that the very top actually already has an, has an opening. Uh, so when you get them, they're, they're, there's already an opening at the top. So, so basically starting from about here down to here, you have to cut that part away, reinforce it with an angle iron that you have to get bent somewhere. Um, I don't know. have to find a place that'll do that. And... Um, uh, again, we've got uh, these these wheels for the um, for the garage door hardware. Uh, there's also a spring here. Now, what the, the purpose of the spring is um, basically to uh, it's kind of attached in the middle, uh, so that you get uh, some assist from the spring when it's at uh, both extremes of of, of its opening, because otherwise it, it gets kind of heavier to open. Um, okay, again, very important is to use steel on steel for the, uh, for the wheels. Uh, don't, don't bother trying rubber casters on wood, because I did that at first, and it's just, there's just way too much friction, and they'll go out of alignment, and everything will go askew, and it's just terrible. So the, you get these V-groove wheels, and uh, there's a piece of angle iron in there, and it's very easy to bend the angle iron into the right, into the right shape uh, to uh, be the circle of the, uh, of the dome. Uh, and to open it, it's just a matter of uh, pulling on a cable which is attached to, to the slit, and you just pull on it. And there's another cable at the other end to close it again. Okay, so how did we do here in meeting our criteria? Uh, well, they're all pretty good in keeping out the weather. The, um, the rollout telescope was very poor in keeping the telescope at uh, ambient temperature because um, it's just a garden shed, it's got a, a dark green roof, so it gets really hot inside. It has very little ventilation. Um, so uh, if you want to use that approach, uh, exactly, the uh, best thing is to have, uh, to open it up a few hours before you want to observe to let the heat out. They're all very fast to set up, uh, all probably less than a minute, you're, you're ready to observe. Keeping out wind and lights, really only the dome does that. The others, you know, you're, uh, the telescope is out in the open, so you've still got the problem with wind and lights. Keeping the telescope clean, of course, uh, once you've got the cover over it and a cloth like a shower curtain over it is very effective. 
Uh, room for storage, well, they can all, uh, all have that, but the rolling cover doesn't really have uh, any storage in, in the way I've implemented it. In terms of keeping out bugs, I found that nothing works. Um, <laughs> they will get through the smallest possible opening. I mean, they even get into your, into your house, I guess, but um, in an observatory, forget it. I mean, they're outside, uh, they are, earwigs, flies, spiders, they will, they will find a way to get in. Ants, um, the only thing that you can do about ants is, you know, you get that uh, ant bait. That's, that's pretty good in um, uh, destroying the ants. Everything else, you, you're going to get the bugs. And, of course, when you're observing, uh, there's no hope you're going to get the mosquitoes. So uh, still no solution for bugs. Keeping out rodents, uh, they're all pretty good, except, again, the rolling cover because it's got uh, a big opening underneath. Oh, I don't think... Rodents have actually lived in it, but uh, there's, there's the potential. They're all able to keep the uh, uh, house uncluttered, uh, keep the uh, instruments outside. Um, they can all accommodate uh, visitors, except the, the, in my implementation of the roll-off roof, I made it only big enough for the telescope, so it's really just big enough for one person. That's not an inherent problem with the roll-off roof, but the bigger you make the roll-off roof, the uh, uh, heavier it is, the heavier the roof becomes. So that's something you have to uh, consider. As for cost, um, not sure. I, I just kind of estimated the rolling cover was maybe $100. The rollout telescope, which is basically just a garden shed, was maybe $150. I don't know what a little garden shed costs these days. The roll-off roof, again, is $200. Um, but that's because the garage doors were left over. So I guess you could say it cost about $1,200 because we had to get new garage doors. Uh, the dome, the dome itself was about $400 and uh, uh, the other stuff probably didn't cost much more than that so I would say less than $1,000 for the, for the dome. Um, so things that I've ignored in this presentation are things that you're going to have to work out yourself like where to put it, uh, if you're going to put electricity out there, run it on batteries if you want a network out there. Um, you know, a wireless network is great, but if you're producing a lot of data and you want to transfer it back to the house, uh, you might want to think about a, 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 a faster wired network. Uh, lights, you know, uh, very difficult to look, look, look for things inside it in the dark, so you want to have some lights, not just, flats, uh, not just a flashlight. And you've got your, your neighborhood, maybe you want to make something that blends in with the neighborhood aesthetics or, uh, you know, color schemes and stuff like that. And vandalism, well, um, again, that's something you have to figure out if you want to put a lock on it. Um, other hints, uh, keep it under 100 square feet. Uh, if you keep it under 100 square feet, you don't have to worry about a building permit. Um, and uh, otherwise, you'll just open a can of worms with that. So. Uh, put a carpet on the floor, and that's uh, obviously to keep, keep your feet warm and to uh, uh, maybe provide some protection for when you drop the eyepieces. Um, <laughs> scrounge for materials. You'll be amazed what you can adapt uh, and uh, uh, what you can find. You can work on it all year round. Don't, don't be afraid of the, doing stuff in the winter. I've worked on the dome in the winter and the other things. Uh, there are nice days in the winter where you can, where you can do that. Um, now, and as for lights and the and the wind, uh, you can all, probably always rig up something if uh, uh, you know that's a problem, because most of these are kind of open air things. And I think that's it. Yeah. So that's it. There you go. Thank you very much. All right then. Um, I haven't yet seen Sanjeev here tonight. Is uh, is Sanjeev here? Yes, he is. Good. Our, uh, our next talk is by uh, one of our members who's uh, been growing in skills and, uh, you know, getting better and better results at astrophotography by the month, I think, over the last couple of years. He's spoken to us a few times in the past on uh, topics to do with astrophotography, but here to uh, present uh, uh, later results and more advanced equipment is Sanjeev Sivril Rasa. Please all welcome him.
Hi, everyone. Okay, so um, I gave a talk back in November, uh, and that was my, so that's why I called this one part two. So it's a follow-up to my November 09 presentation. And uh, I live in Canada, and uh, I started off, as most people do, as a visual observer, and I love going to dark skies. So um, in doing astrophotography, uh, I don't have an observatory, by the way, so it's actually good to follow up Ralph's talk because everything I'm going to say is in the context of not having an observatory. And um, so when I started doing astrophotography, I wanted to do it under dark skies. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is just uh, what, what is possible with a portable setup. Uh, I mean, you don't have an observatory if you live in the city. So today what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about... Um, shooting with portable instruments uh, from a very ultra-wide 24-millimeter lens up to uh, using a, a telescope, a medium-sized telescope, at about 1,000 millimeters of focal length. Um, I'm going to show you some DSLR and CCD images, and also just give you some thoughts on what's worked for me. So uh, just to recap a little bit about, um, I mean, this is kind of what I said back in November, but I just want to sort of lay the context. Um, why shoot under dark skies? Well, um, first of all, you get a lot better signal to noise uh, because you're under dark skies. There's very little sky glow to worry about, especially if you travel to very dark skies, which I often do. Um, you can image right down to the horizon, and um, as a result, you, you have a lot less processing to do because sky glow is not an issue. Um, you also enjoy panoramic uh, starry skies from horizon to horizon, which is you know, quite an end, end in itself, whether you were just using a telescope or just, uh, you know, just standing there. Um, and also you can do uh, visual observations uh, while you're shooting. And, um, you know, it, it's, I'll talk say more about this later, but it's very important, I think, to preserve uh, dark adaptation. So I always shield all my lights, and um, I, you know, when I look at my laptop screen, I make sure I try to put, like, a red film on it. Um, but, of course, there are several challenges to uh, trying to get to dark skies and, and, and shoot with... Uh, uh, astrophotography uh, equipment because uh, there's a weight consideration. There's also a lot of components, as many of you know, um, to to uh, having a system for photography. And um, so you have to set up and take down uh, your equipment each time. And uh, that makes it very difficult to achieve consistent results night overnight. Uh, because if you're in an observatory, you can tweak your setup, you know, have from one session to the next, and that be means that you can kind of improve. Uh, you can identify weaknesses and improve. But if you have to take everything apart, um, everything from, you know, where, where what is the balance point where, you know, where you balance your instruments um, has to be something that you remember, uh, especially if you shoot with a number of different, a number of different focal lengths. Then you have to remember, you know, what spacer did you use for your, uh, for that particular focal length. So that it can be quite challenging that way. And, and the way I've dealt with that, I don't know if you can see this on the bottom, but I'll just read it out to you, is to keep it as simple as possible, because um, there is a certain level of complexity that um, has to be accepted. But the question is, you know, how simple can, can, you, can you keep things? Um, and then, of course, to just keep, keep at it. So practice makes perfect. And, and I think repetition is certainly the, the, the key to success, as far as, far as I can tell. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of patience as well and in not expecting results overnight. So here's a little quiz. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Can people read what's on the list here? Okay. So um, let's try to look at this list and reorder it based on what you think is essential, the most essential for astrophotography to the, to the least... <laughs> To the least essential. Okay, so is this, you think number seven? Okay, is that number one? Okay, what else? Eight, open mind, okay. Camera, okay. Anything else? Okay, well, I think I, I, I actually agree with this audience. So, number, what's essential? Supportive spouse. <laughs> I've been married 10 years, and I can tell you that all good things in life require one of these. And um, if, if you have a supportive spouse, I think you're, you're halfway there. 
Number two is a camera, because we're talking about astrophotography after all, and you can't do photography without a camera. Number three is an open mind. And I'll get, back, I'll get to that later on. And the other things, actually, I don't think are essential, but they're nice to have. And I've tried to reorder them from my perspective. And again, this is coming from the perspective of somebody who's got a portable setup and does not have an observatory. Um, I think that what are not essential, uh, or I've reordered them. If I, would, if, I would, if I would choose from this list, this list I would first pick an equatorial, equatorial mount, because I think with tracking you can do a, a wider range of, of, of photos. And then I'd pick a telescope. Um, and a guide scope is also helpful because then you can get into longer focal lengths and actually guide, not just track your exposures, but also guide the, your mount so the tracking is improved. And that's why the guide scope is number six. And then I think an observatory is, is nice to have. And I would, I would love to have an observatory, but I would want it to be under dark skies. And my wife is a city girl, so it would conflict with number one. <laughs> so no observatory for me. And um, number eight is Arizona quality skies. I think that this is something that, uh, you know, often astrophotographers complain about the seeing in Ottawa um, and the number of clear skies that we get, uh, number of nights of clear skies. But I, I think that there's a lot we can do with the skies that we do have. Um, but, you know, I would, I would love to have those quality skies, but I don't think it's essential. So here's um, a photo that I took uh, in May. Um, so I'm going to try to show you a number of different pictures uh, with different uh, levels of complexity in terms of the equipment that's used. Um, <clears throat> this is the Crescent Moon and Venus. And uh, I shot this near on prior uh, in May. And this is a one second exposure. It's with a 50 millimeter lens on a uh, full frame DSLR, the Canon 5D Mark II. Uh, this is just a tripod mounted shot. So again, at, at twilight, I know many people have taken these kinds of shots. You can see there's earth shine on, uh, on the moon. And this night was a, a great night of, 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 of tra high transparency, and so the sky was really nice and blue. And that over there is Venus. Now this is the same, uh, same scene, but it's with a 135 millimeter lens. Again, it's tripod mounted. This is a two second exposure. So you can see that you know, we, we get to see more detail. Um, but if you go back, I think in terms of what's interesting to the, the audience, uh, to, the, to the viewer, you know, this, this shows more, more, more detail, which is interesting. And you'll see this, this theme come up again and again in my presentation. But this shows more context. So um, if, if it depends on what you're trying to do with your photograph and what you want, what kind of composition you're going for. Uh, so it, I don't think it's only about getting the detail. And I think, I think for most people, they can relate to this kind of a picture more than this kind of a picture. Um, and I often, I have, I have two, two children, a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and I often, after I'm done in an image, I ask them to sit in front of my computer and take a look. And I, I try to gauge their reaction. I say, what do you like more? And uh, they, they give me some very helpful, uh, helpful reactions. So this shot is uh, a six-minute exposure. Um, and it's, uh, it's, 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 on, it's on, a, on a tracking mount. And this is also done in Yarn prior. Um, now, I did this at f4 with a 24 millimeter lens. Um, and it, it, this, this lens, with the, the camera that I'm using here, the Canon 40D, it's a filter modified camera. So I sent it into uh, Hutech in California. And what they do is they take out the, there's a, there's a red, there's a cutoff filter that cuts off part of the red spectrum in DSLRs. Because in daytime photography, it's important to cut out a part of that red spectrum. But for nighttime photography, it's important to, to keep that red, minus some of the sort of the very little bit of it that still needs to be blocked. But, but basically, they replace the glass filter with another piece of glass that's the same thickness. So you get, it, it's, some people call it a, a spectrum enhanced DSLR, but basically, it's not cutting out as much of the red part of the spectrum. So in this picture, the, 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 the chip in this camera is. Uh, is what they call a crop, it's a 1.6 times crop factor chip. So the chip is, it's not a full 35 millimeter chip. It's uh, about 22 millimeters, about 15 millimeters. And that with this lens, I get about a 50 degree field. So if you imagine the whole sky being about 180 degrees from horizon to horizon, this, this distance here is about 50 degrees of sky. And here we're looking at about 35 degrees. Um, now this is six minutes, but there's actually a huge range of photos that you can do be between this two-second exposure and this six minutes. With the wide lens like that, you can actually 
do a lot of tripod mounted shots that are about 30 seconds. And I don't have any of those to show you tonight, but that's an area that I think is, 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 is a, is a, a gold mine in terms of the kinds of shots that can be done, which is just a tripod. And I'd like to experiment more with that when, when I have some time. But, but this shot is actually a, a tracked shot, so it uses an equatorial, equatorial mount. But um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with a website called um, The World at Night. It's uh, T-W-A-N. But if you, go, if you Google The World at Night, you'll see a whole bunch of tripod-mounted photos of scenes like this, but with foregrounds that are really amazing. And I think some of the best astrophotos uh, that I've seen are actually on that website. And the photos taken from around the world. And they're all, most of them are tripod mounted shots. They're not even using an equatorial mount. And what, because what happens, if you look at this shot at F4, uh, with that, that lens that I use is the, is the F1.4 lens, a very fast lens. I could have shot that lens at F2 and used 90 seconds, right? Because when you go to F2 to F2.8, it's a, you're doubling, you're, you're having the amount of light. F2 to F4, you're actually, um, cutting the light by a factor of four. So instead of doing a six minute exposure, you can do a 90 second exposure at F2. Or uh, if you want to go to F1.4, you can do a 45 second exposure. And this is at ISO 800. I usually, I usually show it at ISO 800 for these longer exposures, but you can actually go to ISO 1600. Um, so then you again, if you do that, that lets you have your exposure time again. So there's, there's a huge range of things you can do to, to, to avoid having to do the uh, tracking. But again, what we're getting is more context. We're, getting, we're gonna get less detail, but more context um, with these wide lenses. So now, this is the, obviously the, the central bulge of the galaxy, right? Um, and this is actually in May. Uh, now, you might not think that the Milky Way looks like this in May, but it does at 3 a.m. <laughs> um, and that star there is Antares. That's the Lagoon Nebula, right? And this thing here is the Pipe Nebula. Uh, I usually see it as a horse, but this, 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 this is all the dark nebulae that are in the Milky Way. And um, I'm gonna show you a picture next of this region here. See this region here? Now this, let's go back here. This, 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 this star there's Antares, right? That, that's Antares. So what's, what's happened here is we've now got uh, a 135 millimeter lens on the same camera. So um, we're looking at a field that's nine degrees wide and about six degrees uh, from there to there. Now, <clears throat> this, 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 this thing here is uh, M4. And that globular there is M80. And this is the row of Yuki. It's th this area is very popular with CCD imaging. People, people take very colorful pictures of this area. But I, and a lot of, there's guys who do mosaics of this whole area, and it takes hours and hours. But this is just 57 minutes. And I use three minute sub exposures. So I actually shot 20 three minute shots, but one of them, somebody's green laser got in the way, so I discarded it. So it's 19 times three minutes. Uh, and I use the tracking mount to get this. But pretty much any, uh, any mount, like, Pretty much any equatorial mount, I think, would give you three minutes with the, at this focal length. It's because this is a very forgiving focal length to shoot at, because your star images are very small. So you're not going to see much uh, star trailing, unless, you, unless you've done a bad job of polar aligning your mount, or if you've got it maybe not balanced properly. Um, <coughs> but I, I find that uh, this, this amount of sky is very helpful for... Um, really composing an image that has many elements to it. And um, if you use a star atlas, I'll say a bit about this later, it becomes very easy to, to shoot things like this because I'm talking about an old-fashioned star atlas that you can flip through, right? So again, it's very important to preserve dark adaptation. Um, but I use uran uranometria. It's a, it's a three-volume star atlas, and it's an amazing star atlas. I think, it's, in my opinion, it's the best one out there. And it's it's uh, fantastic, and it actually has a, a grid, a one, one degree by one degree grid, um, that shows you all of these nebula. This nebula here, this dark nebula complex, this one here is B44, but not 44. Um, and you, you can actually see in your star atlas all of these nebulae plotted. So then, you know, you know what, what it is you're trying to get in your picture. 
And I think the star atlas combined with the wide lens, or this is, people will consider this to be a moderate telephoto lens. Um, a star atlas combined with uh, wide lenses or, or moderate uh, focal length lenses, I think are, is a fantastic combination because all of a sudden, all of these nebulae in the, in the, in the, or on the Milky Way and things like dark nebulae become accessible. Because as a visual observer, I, you know, I know I, it's rare that I went after those unless I was using uh, specialized filters. But you know, usually you can use binoculars. You're not going to pick up all this nebulosity. But the other thing about, to note about this is that you can't really see a dark nebula unless you've got a star field that you know, the nebula blocks. And to get the star field, like this whole area, I think is an important part of being able to get this. So you need, you need to have a decent sized field. Okay, here's another shot with the same lens. This is a 135 millimeter lens, same camera. Now this field, this I did in March um, near Perth at a friend's cottage. Uh, this is 64 minutes in total, okay? So I, did, I, I took 10 six minute exposures and you know, in March, Orion is already pretty low. So this is getting pretty low to the, to the western horizon. But um, this is the belt of Orion Right, and there's a sword. And you can see the flame nebula in there, and you can see the, the horse head. And that's Sigma Orionis. It's a multiple star system. And of course, there's the running man, and there's M42. Um, and there's M78 right here, okay? So this is uh, six, again, six degrees roughly. I think I cropped this by a little bit. This is uh, probably about five degrees by maybe seven degrees across or something like that. Again, just to demonstrate that um, without a telescope, there's quite a lot you can do if you go to dark skies. The trouble with shooting with these kinds of lenses in the city or even in the semi-rural skies is that the field is just too wide for the sky glow. The, mo the wider your field, the more sky glow you're going to get. And so if you go this wide in the city or even in semi-rural skies, you're going to be overwhelmed by sky glow before you can pick up the signal that you want to get, unless you want to you do a lot of processing to get rid of it. So here's some thoughts on composition. I think it's very important to know your field of view. Um, I think that and there's a formula, you can figure it out. But basically, it's chip size, it's the focal length uh, compared to the chip size. So the overall size of the chip is what matters in relation to the focal length. So at 24 millimeters, I mentioned I get 50 degrees by 35. And because this, the chip in here is a, is a 3 by 2 ratio, at 135, I'm getting 9 by 6, roughly. So it's important, important to know the, the field of view so you know what you want to get in it. As I said, an old-fashioned star atlas is a fabulous tool for these kinds of shots. And I'll say a little bit more. This is, I have said a bit about this already, but um, I think in composing an image, it's important to ask whether, uh, whether the image looks sort of static or dynamic, right? And I think there's two things that I, that I do that I'm not sure if this is the right terminology that people use, but basically I, off, I put my main subject off-center. Not always, but it depends on what you're looking at. And then I use the, the diagonal of the chip, like that, this way, right? So let's go back for a second. Okay, so I, I suggest to you that if I had centered this area in my picture, it would have been a less interesting photo. And similarly, if I had taken this, this axis here and made this horizontal, it would have looked a bit, le a bit less dynamic than this picture does. Because our eye seems to be drawn to the diagonals. Things look like they're in motion, or they, you know, there's some kind of, it's a different emotion that I think it evokes when you use the diagonal. Now, I, when I'm doing this, I have my, my camera piggybacked, typically it's piggybacked on, the, on a tel telescope, and I have a, ca um, um, a ball head, camera ball head. But the lenses are not heavy, so you can you just get away with the ball head. So, I'm just looking through the viewfinder and trying to aim my camera. So that can be pretty tricky. But uh, because especially if you just want to nudge it a little bit, right? Y you know, the ball head isn't exactly like my ball head, you know, kind of can just move in very across the whole sky with, with a little nudge. So yeah, it kind of takes a lot of patience. And also, if you're trying to get this kind of stuff to show up, it's not like at the, at the eyepiece where you can actually see your target and then keep nudging your scope. Because to, to see all this stuff, you need at least like a 30 second exposure. At, you know, at a very high ISO setting. And then, so it takes a lot of patience. So then you gotta nudge it, take another exposure, nudge it. And so it, to get, I find it's worthwhile. I would rather have 
less exposure time overall, um, and and spend the time to properly frame my subject, than just go nuts and shoot, you know, three or four hours worth of stuff, and then have it you know, not exactly where I want, and I have to go and crop it later on. I think that to me that's a waste. This image I have used both diagonals, right? So again, I think that uh, it creates a more dynamic look. Okay, so we'll just go through this again. <clears throat> okay, now here's um, Comet McNaught. Now this was on June 21st. I tried shooting this comet a couple of times and clouds came in. Just one night I was out, th the night that I shot the Antares picture, that Ro of Yuki picture, I, uh, I was waiting for the comet until 2 a.m. and then the sky was clear. And then at 2 a.m. these clouds came just over the northeast. And, uh, Sanjeev, can you point out the comet, please? Okay, sorry. There's a comet. It's, it's very small in this picture because this is a wide lens. 135. This, th this picture um, was picked as a photo of the week this week by Sky News. And uh, I, don't think you can, I don't know if you can see the tail in this picture. Uh, but it's actually about three degrees long. Like, I cropped this image slightly because this is, uh, this is now about six degrees and this is four degrees. So ideally I would have shot this with a 200 millimeter lens. But I didn't have a 200 millimeter lens so I just shot with a 135 and I cropped it. Um, that star there is Capella. Okay, so this was done, there's a lot of sky glow here because it, it was near dawn. 3 a.m. is already, you know, astronomical night ended at about 2.45 on June 21st. It was one of the shortest nights of the year. Um, so this was, you know, after when, when dawn was approaching, it was very glow near the horizon. But again, I, you know, I, I tried to use that diagonal there. And I, this was probably a, a more deep, this picture shows a bit more detail. This, this is, the same comet, this is about half an hour earlier. Both of these shots are six minutes in total. Exposure, six minutes. So it's, I, I stacked four 90 second exposures. And the thing is, with comets is they move against the background star field. So if you go longer uh, than a few minutes, you're going to see the, the nucleus, if, if you track the stars, you're going to see the nucleus um, smeared, right? Uh, unless you go and you, 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 you stack, like, you know, say 20 minutes of the comet, and then you go and you put one, you use a one, one star field shot as your background, right? But I, I, don't, I, tend, I, like, I, don't, I don't like doing that. That's a composite. I don't really like doing that because I want to catch the star field as I saw it. So this is the star field throughout the whole exposure. It's six minutes. And uh, this is at 480 millimeters. So the field now here on the same camera is uh, two and a half degrees here. And I don't know if the screen shows you, but this, the, the, the tail goes all the way to the end. Yeah. And there's two, there's, the comet had two tails. So um, this one obviously shows more detail. Uh, and, and I send both these shots into Sky News. They pick this one. And I, I tend to agree with them that I like this shot better than this shot, although this one shows more detail. OK, so this is the first picture that I'm showing you that has um, a telescope, right? Uh, it's my Teleview 85 refractor. It's a three and a half inch refractor. All right now, this is with tracking, so we're not into gu any guiding just yet. Just tracking. So this is the equipment that I used for about a year, just over a year, last year, and that's my telescope. And I'm going to show you only two ex equipment pictures, but I think you'll get the, a good sense of uh, what I'm doing. Um, this is a guide scope I borrowed this from Joe. I think he's in the audience. Uh, I've since returned it. Um, this <laughs> this uh, is my refractor, my little refractor. Uh, all of my instruments, by the way, uh, are optimized for visual observations, they just, but they happen to be fantastic at uh, astrophotography as well. Um, now, this mount uh, is the Vixen mount. It's a very tiny, medium-sized, small mount, it, it, but uh, it, it served me well, uh, but I've moved on from it now. And this is a side-by-side -side setup. Okay? Some people call this a tandem setup. And this is under dark skies. And uh, in my last presentation, I said a lot about how I go out and I shoot. Well, basically, I keep my laptop in there, in the van, and then um, it's always handy. So I have to think about which way I, where I park it, because it depends on which side of the sky I'm going after. Because you know, if I, if I go the wrong side of the sky, the cables will all get yanked out. So I want to show you three pictures that, that I've shown before that I did with that setup, OK? That side-by-side that, that -side setup with that little refractor. This is, uh, M42, and um, this was uh, about 123 minutes 
of exposures. Now, this, this is a composite because I had to take, I did a series of six-minute exposures, and then I did a series of 40-second exposures and a series of 10-second exposures, and then I, I stacked them, I combined them digitally and to get this image. And that's a, tip, that's a typical technique for this because, uh, because the dynamic range of this, sub, this object here is, is, is too much for, for the chip. Um, I think I'm trying to speed up a little bit because I might be running out of time. Um, this is the Andromeda Galaxy. This is only 42 minutes. It's seven frames. Uh, and this is from Neon Prior. Okay? Both these shots I took on the same night. Okay? Uh, by the way, this shot also was, was picked as Sky, by Sky News as the photo of the week. Um, M42. And then this is M33. Uh, all with the same setup. I did this in September last year at Nirvana, which is uh, you know, near Bonnet, Bonneco Provincial Park. This is under Max 7 skies. This is uh, about 85 minutes in total. And this is the first shot I'm showing you with a CCD camera, the STZNXME. And uh, the, the, the field here is still pretty wide. M33 is a pretty large object. Okay. So in terms of equipment, um, let me see. How much time do I have? Negative something. Do I? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So um, what if we want to see more detail? So um, if basically, I think this is the, the what I'm going to show you next is what most people jump to right away, which is to get high resolution pictures or as high resolution as you can get of uh, things like galaxies and basically small objects. Um, and there are two limits to, for portable uh, photography if you're going to get higher resolution. One is portability, of course, and the other is the seeing conditions. <clears throat> so my approach was to get larger optics that are still easy to carry and use in the field. And then, of course, you need a bigger mount. And I use a, a small pixel CCDs. All my cameras have small pixels in them. And that's because you can get a larger image scale. Um, and I, that's, that's a whole topic in its own right. But basically, the small objects will look big, on you, and so you can see, see more detail. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll get more resolution, because you also need more aperture to get more resolution. But you certainly, you'll get bigger looking pictures, bigger looking targets in your, in your image. So that's what I'm using now for, my, for a lot of my high resolution. Well, I would call it medium resolution photography. Uh, this is the Takahashi mount. It's a pretty heavy duty mount, but the amazing thing about it is that it's very, very portable. That is a five and a half inch refractor, it's the Take 140. And I got this in March, I got this in February. Uh, and then I have a CCD camera, it's the QSI 583. And this camera, the pixels in it are 5.4 microns square. And um, the important thing to note is this, this is, uh, uh, before you put your system together, you gotta figure out what kind of field of view you're looking for and what kind of image scale you're looking for. And most people say divide your seeing by three, by two or three, depending on what school of thought you follow. And the average seeing in Ottawa may be around three arc seconds. So I went with 1.1. I thought that was, that was pretty good. But I know people that, uh, like Doug George, I think was telling me that he shoots at 0.6, up to 0.6. So it all depends on, uh, you know, where you think you might be exceeding your seeing. I wanted to be, you know, under the seeing on most nights. That's a, almost a one degree feel that I get with this. And this is my, auto, uh, my uh, guide scope. It's only a 50 millimeter guide scope from Borg. Okay, so that's enough. It's 250 millimeter focal length. It's enough to guide this, this thing at 1,000 millimeters. Sanjeev, yeah? isn't that the uh, 40 by 60 by 45 arc minutes rather than arcs? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That's a, that, that's a mistake. You're right. Yes, that would be a pretty tiny field of view. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's arc minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's arc minutes. Um, so you get almost a degree uh, to about three quarters of a degree. Okay, the chip in here is about eighteen millimeters by thirteen point five, so it's a, it's a four by three ratio. Okay, so a couple a couple of things to say about my setup. I left the tandem setup and went to piggyback, as you might have noticed. The tandem, which is side by side, is more versatile because you can mix and match different OTAs, but the balance is much more critical, and it works better on smaller lenses and smaller scopes. The piggyback is a lot more rigid, so it's better for heavier setups. I let go of my guide rings, and I went just using tube rings. So there's no guide rings on that guide scope that you saw, and it's because the guide rings can create flexure on long exposures. 
And I don't use my go-to. I do manual slewing because it helps me keep my knowledge of the sky. But also the biggest thing is less setup time because you align, I only have to pull a line. I don't have to do any other star alignments. And I don't tell my mount where the meridian is. So the meridian is a line that runs north-south through the sky. It's an imaginary line. It's important because when an object is at the meridian, that's when it's in the highest point in the sky. So when it's on the east side of the meridian, it's rising. When it's on the west side of the meridian, it's, it's setting. And the best part in terms of you know, when the, uh, the placement of the sky is, of course, when an object is near the meridian. But most equatorial mounts, when they get to the meridian, they do a meridian flip because they can't track past the meridian. So I don't tell my mount where the meridian is. I only, give, I only tell it where Polar Polaris is. And what I found is that I can actually then start my mount off on the wrong side of the meridian, and then I can image for about four or five hours while the, my object is placed high in the sky. And um, that's the function of your mount. With my mount, I, f I found out that this is the way, and I'd gladly give up the go-to for that. So I'm going to show you a couple of images that I've done with this, that setup. This is M81, M82. This is uh, about 200 minutes altogether. Uh, M51. Now this is a slightly cropped. This is actually the, the more of a full field in that camera. It's just about, about a degree across. This is about half a degree, so I've cropped it. That's about three hours of data there, and that's near Perth. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite subjects for visual observation. These two galaxies are about 40 million light years away. See this group here? That's Hickson 56. And I presented this as a, as a uh, deep sky challenge one, once, one month here at RASC. I've been, observe, I've been able to observe three of these through my uh, daub, 14 and a half inch daub, visually. But, uh, you know, even a small refractor, I'm going to pick this up uh, if you use the CCD camera. And this is the last shot I'll show you. This is, again, a favorite target of for visual observation. It's a coma galaxy cluster. Most of what you're seeing here <coughs> are galaxies, not stars. This cluster is about 300 million light years away and has, um, it has uh, you know, probably thousands of galaxies. Um, these two are giant elliptical galaxies. Uh, I think it's NGC 4874 and 489. And this is about a half, a uh, just over a half degree field. Um, this thing is a star up here. And it, whatever looks were kind of really round on stars, everything that looks fuzzy is a galaxy. And one thing I was going for here is that you, uh, you probably can't see this, whether the arrows are pointing, is a distant quasar. I only see one for sure. It's Mag 21. It's not, this, it's not this bright thing here. It's actually like you can't see it. It's in the middle of those things there. Um, you can't see it because of this the screen, but if you go, I have a little website. I can tell you what after if, if you want, but that'll show you where that is. But it's a tiny faint speck, but it's believed to be more than 10 billion light years away. So it's a really f far background object. And Mag 21, I think, is not bad to reach with the, with the five and a half inch scope. So this is about 140 minutes in total, uh, and it was done at a very, very dark site, about three hours north of here, Laveron Forest Reserve. Okay, so what I, I just want to say a few words about an open mind, which I think is very critical. One of the first, the three most essential things. I think it's very important to learn from others, um, and displaying one's images, whatever that you're sharing them on the web or, you know, emailing them to friends. I think is very important, and it's important I found to seek feedback and to learn to deal with criticism. Because when someone says something negative about my images, I mean, I'm sure it's the same for everybody, but it does, it does kind of strike you right in the heart. Um, because you spent all this time and sleepless night getting out there and doing this, and you think, wow, this is fantastic. And then someone says, well, it looks a little blue. Or, you know, I mean, <laughs> I think you kind of look at it and go, well, they might be right. And I think it's very important to keep an open mind. And I, I think you can still improve without sharing your images, but I think one can improve much faster by sharing images and and, and listen, getting feedback, seeking feedback actively, and letting people know that, you know what, if they say something negative about your image, it's okay, because people might be shy and they might not want to you know, hurt your feelings. Um, I think it's very important to maintain an awareness of oneself and surroundings. That's why I say that dark adaptation is very, very important. I like seeing the whole panorama of the sky, and it lets me adapt what I'm going to shoot. If one part of the sky looks hazy, I'll just do, go and shoot something else, but I'd like to see the whole sky. And I think it's very important to look at what you can influence and what you can't, and just focus on the, on the first category of things. So you know, we can improve our guiding, improve our tracking, et cetera, but you know, can't control the weather, can't control you know, things if, if your child is sick. 
I mean, this is stuff, stuff that you just accept. So I don't spend a lot of time pulling out my hair, and I don't spend a lot of time, um, you know, worrying about what could have been. Just, you know, whatever is in front of you, make the most of it. Um, and also, I think it's important to avoid being an expert in one's hobby. Um, in my day job, I do get paid to be an expert, not, not in astronomy, something else unrelated. But I think that um, expert, I think, an ex I think expertise in one's hobby can lead to uh, being unnecessarily burdened by other people's expectations. And um, I, I personally prefer to always be a beginner. I think that beginners have a lot more fun and they're able to see every effort as an adventure. <clears throat> so a couple of parting thoughts. Um, I think we suffer from an abundance of riches in terms of dark skies. Uh, we have 45 minutes away in max 6.5 skies. If you go two hours away or three hours away, you get into pristine max 7 skies. And our seeing is good enough, unless you're seeking very high resolution, which I think of as only one kind of imaging. Um, I think we have plenty of time to enjoy astrophotography from the Ottawa area. And uh, we have about three, uh, an average of three clear moonless nights a month. Sometimes it's zero, and sometimes it's five or six. Um, but I think it, the advantage of it is it gives enough time for one's day job, family life, and also processing. Uh, so the only thing is we have to supply the passion and the energy. So that's it. So, if anyone has any questions? Uh, <laughs> yeah? Uh, you were talking about the um, filter and the DSLR, the one that you change at UTEC. Right. Uh, does it compromise the daytime photography if you take that filter out? Yes, it does. What it does is it makes your daytime images look kind of pinkish. It gives a pinkish hue okay. because it's allowing that red, that red part of the light in. But there's people, if you still want to use, use, use that same camera for daytime photography, you can put a, a filter on your lens, and Hutech sells those filters. Or you can do what they call a custom white balance, and it's a way of, of, uh, of, of basically changing the white balance on your camera after you've taken the shot. And, um, but there's a number of ways of doing it. My, my solution was just to get another camera. <laughs> 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 with, yeah, which is which is actually my the camera that I, most of my shots are actually pictures of my kids. So my my wife was supportive of that. Anybody else? Yep. Uh, when you were talking about wide angle photography, you mentioned shooting at f four uh, and doing a longer exposure. Maybe you could explain why you why you uh, stop it down to f four rather than right. Okay, well, there's two reasons. And if you have the tracking, then if like if you, if you want to stick with the tripod, I would go with faster. But if you have a fast lens and you're actually paying a lot more to buy a fast lens, then why, should, why stop it down? Well, first thing is that for image quality, even the best lenses at the corners will show some aberrations, especially when you shoot a star, uh, star field. If you shoot a daytime photograph, you probably won't notice it. But when you shoot stars, there's actually stars in the corners. And so they could, might look slightly, slightly elongated. If you stop a one point, f1.4 lens down to f2 or f2.2, you're going to get rid of that for the most part. If you go to f4, you'll get a super sharp on the corners. Um, but the other reason I go to f4 is I think that there's a better dynamic range in your pictures. If you shoot like at ISO 1600, a 30 second shot, and you shoot your lens wide open, I think, and, I, and this is not something I've tested, but I think that your, your picture might look very bright overall. I think if you, if you shoot at ISO 800 or ISO 400, and I, I don't shoot at ISO 400, I only shoot at ISO 800, if you shoot at ISO 800 and you do, you stop it down, I think that, I don't, know, I don't know why, but I think you get a better range of brightness in your picture. So uh, that um, you, you might, might have, it might have more, te more texture to it and more depth to it. So that's why I, I did that. But, but, I, uh, but if I'm shooting, shooting with a tripod, I would definitely go up to about 30 seconds and increase the ISO speed and open it up, not completely fully, because I think that the, the aberrations in the corners will still bug me. So I would probably go to f2 with that lens. Anything else? Yep. Just wondering about tracking. You, uh, you mentioned that you use uh, sectorial mounts. So I was wondering about those. Uh, there's a, a device which is it's not like a barn door, but it was just a, just has a, it's just a camera with a mount for tracking. It has like an arm. Yeah, it's the AstroTrack. I haven't tried it. But I've, there's rave reviews about it. If you go and Google it, you'll find it. Uh, but a lot of people that shoot with DSLRs and, that, and want some kind of tracking, that's, that's the, the kind of thing they go for. Um, but I think you still have to polar align that. So there's still some work involved in that. Yeah. When you set in the field, you always measure polar alignment. Have you ever tried the drift method instead? 
No, I don't. Uh, I think that would take a long time. I I have a pretty good polar scope in my in my in my school. In both both the mounts that I showed you have a polar scope, and I just use that. Oh, okay. <coughs> and I find if I if I, I find if I'm doing a long exposures, I just auto guide, and that neutralizes the any kind of any minor error in my in my polar alignment. But but I do take time to polar line properly with through the polar scope. Okay, if we could, we're a little bit late for the break, so okay. oh, it died. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs> okay. uh, next up, we have. Uh, a uh, couple of observing certificates. So every once in a while, you know, I was talking about benefits of being a member of the society, that sort of thing. Um, one of the, or multiple of the things that are offered that are kind of cool is they have various observing certificates. So you can go and uh, look up a list of things to go out and observe. And over time, you can collect your observations, all of these. And eventually, when you've completed one of these lists or your observing challenges, then uh, you can submit your records to uh, RESC. And you get a nice certificate suitable for framing afterward to show all your friends that you really have spent that much time out under the stars with wife permission, of course, or husband, as the case may be. So we've got a couple of presentations here tonight. The first of them uh, coming up. Next slide, please. There we go. For Santosh Gupta, is he here tonight? Aha, there's a person moving in the back there. There's, there's motion. Come on up to be pre presented by Chuck O'Dale, our audacious president here. Yeah. There we go. Okay, very good job, Santosh. And next up, we also have the Messier uh, certificate for Anthony McDonald. Is he here, please? Anthony in the back there. Come on down and be admired uh, by all the crowd. <laughs> Well done, indeed. There you go. I have never seen them all, so you're way ahead of me on this one. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I have a challenge for you. No one has ever received a lunar certificate. Something's wrong. Is that right? Did you all hear that? No. no. Uh, well, Chris tells me that in the center, no one has ever received the lunar certificate, the, the uh, Isabel Williamson certificate. Ooh. Who's going to be first? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, that's number one, I believe, <laughs> if I remember. Would have thought so, but... Uh, Ryan refers to it in all his talks, but no one has taken the challenge yet. Someone's got to Really, really. So there's an opportunity out there. One of you could be the first. Go down in history as the first Ottawa member to get one. Whew. How can you stand uh, not having that? Okay, next up, Al Scott uh, with uh, what's new in the world of astronomy, the astronomy news. Welcome, Al. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm told this has to be the uh, five-minute astronomy news, but <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I'll do what I can. So, uh, sure. So I've got a few uh, interesting items for you. Um, this, this talk I, tonight is about astronomy that you don't need to build an observatory in your backyard to do or uh, carry camera equipment around in your car to do. Uh, mostly you need a computer and uh, several million dollars. <laughs> so the Kepler Observatory was launched in March 6 of 2009. It's a space uh, telescope. The scientific objective of the Kepler mission is to explore the structure and diversity of planetary systems. This is achieved by surveying a large sample of stars. And the goals are to determine the percentage of terrestrial and larger planets there are in or near what's called the habitable zone of uh, a wide variety of stars. This is where water is liquid at the particular orbital distance. Determine the distribution of sizes and shapes of the orbits of these planets. Estimate how many planets there are in multiple star systems. Determine the variety of orbit sizes and planet reflectivity sizes, masses, densities, short period, giant planets. Identify additional members of each discovered planetary system and uh, determine the properties of the stars that do har harbor planetary systems. So uh, quite a 
an ambitious uh, set of goals for this uh, recently launched telescope. So how does it do it? Well, you can see here, this is a light curve of a star observed by the Kepler Observatory. And what it shows, this axis, the vertical axis is brightness, and the horizontal axis is time. So the star has got this brightness, and all of a sudden, boop, it goes down, and then it goes back up, and goes down, and goes up, and goes down, in a very periodic fashion. What's happening is a planet is transiting the star. The planet's moving across the surface of the star. When a planet moves in front of the star, this is one of these things blown up down here. And you can see how the brightness of the star dims. We can measure the depth of that, and that tells us something about the shape, the size of the planet with respect to the star. And we know roughly what the size of various different types of stars are, so we can tell directly from this measurement what the size of the planet is. And the frequency of these repeats tells us something about the orbit of the planet. Um, now, for a planet to transit a star, as seen from our solar system, the orbit of that planet has to be kind of lined up with our line of sight. It can't be orbiting like this with a star in the middle. It has to be aimed right towards us. And the probability for an orbit to be properly aligned is something like the diameter of the star divided by the diameter of the orbit. Uh, for an Earth-like planet, such as ours, that's about a 0.5% chance, if the Earth-like planet exists, that we would actually see it in this method. And that's not a big chance. Uh, for uh, giant planets that have been discovered in four-day orbits, you know, really in close, you've got big Jupiters in close to the stars, there's been a lot of these kind of things discovered, which is, as astronomers think was a little bit weird. Those ones probably is more like 10%. So in order to detect many planets, one has to look at a lot of stars. Not just a few hundred, but thousands of stars. Kepler stares continuously, 24-7, at a field of 100,000 stars. So if Earths are rare, a null result would still be significant. If they don't detect any of them, they know that you know, there's not many Earth-like planets in these type of orbits over the lifetime, three and a half year lifetime of the mission. Um, the Kepler telescope itself is a 0.95 meter telescope, uh, which uh, covers a field of about 10 by 10 degrees on the sky. Uh, the field of most telescopes are less than one by one degree, of course. So it's really a neat design in terms of the optics of this, of this beast. So you need to have a very big telescope to get rid of all this noise that you get when you're counting the photons of dim stars. Because in a, in a 10 by 10 degree field, you've got to get 100,000 stars. So you're getting some pretty dim stars. So Kepler was designed, the system was designed to just detect a grazing transit of an Earth-like planet in front of a 12th magnitude star, like the sun. I'm not talking like OB stars or bright stars. Uh, astronomers then have a lot of work in front of them to sift through the data that's coming down here, 100,000 stars, photometry of all these stars, um, a, a picture every uh, six hours, basically, of each star, a brightness, another dot on the, on the screen. And they have to uh, then look through all these light curves to detect stars. And the bottom here, you can see some of, the, some of the neat light curves that have been recorded by this instrument for various stars. None of these are actual planet planets going in front of the stars. So these are called variable stars. And the astronomers have to distinguish the variable stars from the actual planet crosses. Here's a Cepheid, which has a very fixed period depending on its brightness. This is a recurrent nova, which goes, blows up every now and then, and then accretes more mass, and then blows up an eclipsing binary star pattern. So here, instead of a planet moving in front of a star, it's another star, a dimmer star moving in front of a brighter star, and then going behind it. And this is uh, our core Borealis, which is a, more of an exploding type thing where it pushes off a whole bunch of dust and gets dim for a while, and then the dust kind of expands and it gets brighter again. Now, they are using software when they're sifting through this. They're not going through each star one at a time. Yes, yeah, there, there's definitely, a lot, of this is, a lot of this astronomy, there's so much data that's being built in astronomy that most of this is being done by computer. So they look for periodic signals in software and then they go by hand and look at the interesting candidates uh, one by one. This is actually a widget that you can download uh, from this site, and it keeps track of all the stuff that Kepler's being uh, discovering. You can put this on your, on your desktop if you want to follow along and do, do some astronomy uh, without having the millions of dollars. It's free, it's open source. Uh, and if you go here, they're actually making the data available to amateurs. There's a lot of data. The data is 
you know, a certain fraction of data is being released to the public for people to, to do various projects. There's papers coming out on all sorts of the interesting types of variable stars. Uh, because of the data, there's just so much data there. People just can sift through the, the, the gigabytes of data and, and if you have any sort of uh, computer background, you can actually program your own search routines and go through the data and, and make interesting discoveries. That's going to be a bit of a, a theme of some of my talks tonight. Um, the second news item uh, has got some acronyms involved. The LBTAO stands for the Large Binocular Telescope on Mount Graham. AO stands for Adaptive Optics. The Large Binocular Telescope is pictured down here. Uh, it's an optical IR instrument, and it has two 8.4 meter primaries. So this is uh, the fifth observatory that you wouldn't want in your backyard. <laughs> but wow, what, a, what, a, what an instrument. So astronomers make this thing, and the, the goal of this telescope is to make some extreme resolution imaging and interferometry. But the problem is the atmosphere. This thing is still sitting in the atmosphere. Uh, as Sanjeev said, the seeing around Ottawa is something like three arc seconds. Well, the limit of telescopes this big, the resolution should be fractions of an arc second that you can achieve with it, but you're limited by the blurring and distortion in the atmosphere. And what happens is you get a star image like this and not like an airy disk pattern like you should get from a perfect telescope. Even though these mirrors are perfect, the atmosphere distorts the starlight as it comes to us, and then you get something like that. The larger a telescope mirror, the finer its achievable resolution. Um, so, t the twinkling of the star is actually the thing that causes this problem. The, the star appears to twinkle, and it's, it's due to the turbulence in the atmosphere. You can't really achieve the ultimate limit of the telescopes as they're built. So, what do astronomers do? Well, they use adaptive optics systems. This is a picture of the adaptive optics uh, secondary mirrors in these telescopes. So, the 8.4 meter primaries, there's a little secondary mirror out in a, on, a, on, a, on a strut out there, and that's this thing here. It's a 95 centimeter, uh, it's a deformable mirror. And what these things are, these are little magnets glued to the back of about a, a millimeter thin sheet, which is the secondary mirror. And these magnets go up into these holes, and we've got all these little circuit boards around here, and they have little voice coils back here that move the magnets in and out by a few nanometers at a time. So, but how do they know how to correct it? What they're doing is correcting the atmosphere. Adaptive optics works. You build a system that basically samples the image, the distorted image, at several different places around the aperture of the telescope. So you're looking at, you basically use a micro lens array, for example, a whole bunch of little lenses, and you focus a whole bunch of images of the star, and you can see how those images move around on your detector from different points in the telescope. And that is because of the atmosphere causing the star image to, to smear around. So each little dot here is from a different line through the atmosphere that hits a different spot on the telescope. If the telescope's working correctly and there's no atmosphere, they all focus to the same dot. But because it's not, you get this smear. But when you turn an adaptive optics system on, it actually looks at each different subsection in the telescope and calculates a correction for it. And that correction is then put onto one of the magnets on this mirror and moves it by a few nanometers and brings that dot back into the middle. So you've got 600 and some actuators here, 600 and some little images of the star that you're calculating corrections on, and the speed you have to do this at is a thousand times a second to actually get rid of the turbulence. That's, you know, if you're looking on a hot road, you can see wavering images in the background. That's the, the distortion caused by the atmosphere that this is taking out. So uh, this is actually a picture of a couple images. This one is by Hubble of a globular cluster core, and this is by one of the two 8.4 meter telescopes with the adaptive mirror optics turned on. So it's actually getting better resolution from the ground than the Hubble by about a factor of three. So uh, I want to show you now what happens when they turn on the adaptive optics. So we're going to run a little movie here. This is the star twinkling in the sky and they're going to turn on the system. <laughs> and you can see basically the, the diffraction limited image of the, of the main disk. And it's a triple star. 
You need a relatively bright star to make 600 and some images and update them in 1,000 times a second, though. So that's one of the limitations of these systems is you have to have a pretty bright star in your field to be able to do this right. And they're developing laser systems to actually do this better for some of the bigger observatories. Finally, uh, I want to talk to you about how you can get involved with these instruments, how you can take a little piece of these multi-million dollar facilities and do your own uh, imaging, if you like. A lot of these telescopes have public data policies. The data, there's so much data available that the primary scientists just can't use it all. They're, they're making it available to the public. Uh, you go to the websites, there are, there are data centers you can go to, you can download the data, you can write your own program to sift through it, you can write your own image processing software if you'd like. If you like image processing, make pretty pictures with an 8.4 meter telescope. It's the same data that the professionals are using. I just put a list of some of these things. I was at, at the Astronomical Hardware Conference in San Diego last week and looking at some talks on, on these new next generation of of telescopes. One of the interesting things that one of the plenary sessions they were saying how many pixels of on the sky versus year. And back in the 80s, they estimated there was about a million pixels on the sky uh, total in the world. And now we have the PanStars telescope here, which came into service on 2010, has 1.4 billion pixels on its own. Uh, this is Hinoti, which is the Japanese telescope. I think Sylvie sent, showed you some uh, images and movies of the sun. It's staring at the sun. It's a big telescope. It was launched in 2006. It's got x-ray, ultraviolet, optical, 0.2 arc second uh, imaging. It's producing 10 gigabytes of data per day. And the data is available at this website if you want to look at it. Do anything you want with it. PanStars uh, is, in a, is in Hawaii. Um, it's just got first light in uh, May 13th, 2010. It's surveying 6,000 square degrees per night down to magnitude 24 at 0.3 arc seconds uh, sampling. It's producing 10 terabytes of data per day on clear nights. Basically what it's going to do is it's going to survey the entire sky down to magnitude 24 every four months. The data is on a three-year embargo though so that the, the scientists who developed it and designed it and spent their blood, sweat, and tears to make this thing actually get to have the prestige of making the first papers on it. However, they have a policy that 2% of the data is available for outreach through the PI, Nick Kaiser at uh, University of Hawaii. So you can email him if you're interested in having 2% of 10 terabytes per day to look through. <laughs> as long as you promise not to scoop him on the scientific discoveries. And then this is one of the next big things, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is currently being designed and built, is planned to be on the sky by fall 2015. 3.2 gigapixels, 30 terabytes per day, a 6.7 meter primary at the 10 square degree field. It's going to survey the entire sky down to this magnitude in about th every three days. And it's going to make the data available uh, it's open data policy. It's going to be going to Google Sky, and there's going to be you can you'll be able to email them to get transient alerts, and they'll put you on their mailing list whenever they discover a transient. Um, other telescopes that I didn't put on here, the, the Canadian France Hawaii Telescope Megacam, is a 340 megapixel one by one degree by one degree sensor, which also has uh, open data available at the Canadian Astrophysical Data Center compiled over 2,300 hours from the last five years, uh, a wide survey of the sky. Uh, and you can go, they actually have software, free software available online that processes the images, subtracts the darks for you, and you can get images from that uh, if you want. Uh, so just some interesting things uh, if you want to do this without having to build an observatory in your backyard. Thanks. Thank you, Al. A little bit quicker. <laughs> okay, next up, uh, we're just going to look at observations quite quickly. The first one I'll speak to, um, I don't remember who actually contributed this one, but it's a shot taken from the ISS. Uh, what's interesting about it, uh, you're, uh, you're all familiar with the uh, uh, aurora borealis that we see up here uh, in the wintertime. Uh, there's a southern version of that occurs around the south uh, end of the planet, 
uh, aurora australis instead. So a uh, kind of same thing that we're used to be seeing, but uh, on the other end of the planet. Nice shot, I'd say. Uh, next up after that, uh, Paul Commission. A little bit to talk. You You better hold it because I got I got a flashlight here. You don't have enough light. Right. By the way, before I forget, uh, my pictures uh, are uh, taken with an S big. That's the Santa Barbara SD10 XME cam. It's a CCD camera. So did you know all the, all the pictures I show are with that camera, and uh, a meet 14 inch LX200. My size of field is 17 and a half minutes, arc minutes, by 11 and 3 quarter arc minutes. This is very, very small compared to what Sanjeev takes, because it takes him quite a few hours. It takes me 10 minutes to reach 18th magnitude. But the thing is that I can't take these large pictures. I live in Bar Haven, just uh, south of uh, Fallow Field Road, and if I wanted to take a two degree field, it would uh, look like a white sheet or something. So anyways, now the first one there is uh, 4321, NGC 4321, that's M100. It's at 12 hours, 22 minutes, plus 15 degrees. This is a grand design spiral. This thing looks quite a bit like M101, but it's a little smaller. It's 107,000 light years in diameter, which means that it's about the size of our Milky Way galaxy, and it's 49 million light years away. So it's comparable with the Milky Way, and it's about 49 million light years away. This, is, this by the way, is these grand design uh, spirals are very nice because they're, they, they have a very nice symmetry and stuff like that. Next, please. Okay, this is the known as the Black Eye Galaxy. It, uh, it's been identified that there's also a radio source in there, but the main thing is that that, that dust lane is created uh, by a dust cloud, a very large dust cloud. No one knows uh, exactly the size of it, but it's extremely large and it's very opaque, so that's why you have that black band across. By the way, the band is not in the same plane as the plane of the galaxy, so this is why it's seen over, sort of over the top. Uh, this one is 65,000 light years in diameter, so it's about uh, two-thirds the size of the Milky Way, and it's 24 million light years away, so it's much closer and much smaller. Okay, next one, please. Okay, this one I had a lot of trouble with. This is, this is hard. I had to spend 15, I think it's 15 minutes in there, that I had to, uh, this thing, uh, this is the uh, Bernard Galaxy. Uh, that, this one is a, a dwarf, and it's uh, about 1.6 million light years away. But even Hubble had trouble with it because he used to say that he could see it better in the finder of the 100 inch than in the 100 inch itself. And one fellow said to him, well, why is that? He said, because it's all over the place, which it is. It's kind of a, it's a very difficult thing to see because it's sort of, it's boxy and it's got an up and sort of up and down pole on it, you know, a bar on it. But it, it's, it's a difficult uh, galaxy. I would say, if you can, it's in Sagittarius. It's, right now, it's quite uh, easily seen. So I would suggest, if you have a chance to look at it, it's about 15 degrees south of the uh, celestial equator. So it's not a bad uh, object for a uh, uh, challenge object. Thanks very much. And thank you, Paul. Next up, if I remember correctly, Tom Butterworth. Tom, are you here? Oh, okay, well, let's look at the pretty pictures. So, Clavius region on the moon, and next please, and uh, the Cocoon Nebula. Rather nicely done, huh? Very pretty. Next up, we have Gary Boyle. Uh, which one do you prefer? Oh, I'll take this one, all right. Thanks a lot. Um, just a few photos here. There's some real cool photos because of the heat wave we've been having for the last few days. I thought I'd have a, a little theme to it. So here we have the Eskimo Nebula taken uh, through my 12-inch uh, LX200 just at uh, prime focus with uh, my uh, Canon uh, Rebel XS, XSI. Uh, next image, please. 
uh, getting even cooler. Um, I think the temperature in the audience just came down by about 10 degrees, seeing the Pleiades. Of course, see the Pleiades high up in the sky is about minus 20 outside. So hopefully I've cooled you off a bit. And it's almost time to polish our shovels because in about five months from now, we'll be getting one of these. <laughs> Do we feel cooler now? Are we liking these days now compared to those days? No. Next slide. But when the storms are, are, are uh, complete uh, and the sun comes out, of course, it melts uh, icicles, such as off my observatory. Just happened to catch this uh, uh, little water droplet coming down. So uh, poetry in motion, so to speak. Um, but when the sky is clear and we open up our domes uh, uh, to really enjoy, again, the winter skies. The summer skies are great, but as Sanjeev said, our nights are so short. Um, all about maybe five, four and a half hours of true astronomical if you want to photograph the sky, you can observe compared to wintertime. Here we have Orion the Hunter. And lastly, then we can bring out the actual uh, cameras and photographs such as the Orion Nebula. Uh, for our first time visitors, this is a, uh, um, an emission nebula where stars are being born at, as we speak. It's about 1,500 light years away and something like 700 stars are, uh, are, are, will be born in, in that uh, nebula over millions of years. And just keeping with this up, just a couple of minutes ago, uh, Joe Bottom and myself went to the IMAX theater on, on the Quebec side, and they have Hubble 3D, and just an amazing moving in 3D into the Orion Nebula. It's just fantastic. It's about a 45-minute show, mostly on the Hubble, the repair of the Hubble, uh, but it's well worth the 45 minutes uh, that, the, that the show is. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Drew. Uh, next one up, uh, Rolf Meyer. Uh, he's got a shot for us. Okay, well, there it is. It's uh, a couple of nights ago, ISS, and it's the first time I got it with the C-14. It was a lot bigger than I thought it would be. It's about the size of Jupiter, and uh, it was very hard to do because it covered the, the entire detector. It was about uh, 480, the full 480 pixels, so next time I'll have to remove the Barlow and try it again and maybe get more detail. I guess that's it. Very nice. Thank you. So just while you're watching, Chris and I have got a running gag going here about how close can we get the podium over here and still have people try and sneak in between. Uh, so uh, apparently we're not close enough yet. <laughs> we'll keep trying. Thank you, Rolf. Okay. Uh, done from there. Uh, our last presentation of the evening, I know we're running a little bit late, but I have a, I have a promise that uh, we're going to move along fairly quickly. Uh, Deborah attended the uh, RESC General Assembly in New Brunswick a short time ago, and she's brought us back some uh, shots from her time there. Deborah? I'll go this way. <laughs> well done. I gave the, the game away. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. I, after, can you hear me? I can't hear myself. After all that, I have, what, a minute and a half? Uh, two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, earlier this evening, Bill mentioned that one of the benefits of being in the RESC is going to the General Assembly. If you're able to, there are 29 centers in, in the RESC, and there's a General Assembly held every year in one of those centers. And they usually try to go from at east to west to, to central, the east to west. And this year it was in New Brunswick. I'm going to need that pointer. Oh, you're going to need it, sorry. And there's a light on that too? Yep, uh, the laser's in the middle, the big button. Okay. So uh, this year it was in Fredericton, New Brunswick, which was really special for me because that's where I grew up. So I was really excited to go back there. I haven't been there for about a decade. And my mom and my brother's family is still there, so I got a chance to do some vacationing and uh, family visiting as well. And is it top or left? Right. Top or bottom, but it's right. No, 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 the right side. All right. Okay, all these photos you see uh, uh, are photos taken by myself or Peter because uh, I wanted to do some photography while I was here. So uh, um, one of the trips that, uh, first of all, I should say that um, uh, one, of the, one of the best things uh, about these GAs is the tours that they usually give. And this one in particular, they had two days of tours, full days, except for the poor national reps that had to sit in the, uh, the building of the university. Uh, the first day, um, we went off to uh, a whale watching tour. And here, it's in the center, right? 
Okay, Fredericton is up around here. So a bunch of people jumped in a bus and came down to St. Andrews here. Peter and I drove a rental. We saw that, I don't know, school bus and said, hey, let's just go in the rental. So uh, we came down here and we got on the Jolly Breeze. Uh, looks like a big ship. There were about 45 of us, so it was pretty crowded. And we sailed out here into the bay and we did some whale watching. And the next day, just to let you know, we went down to here, which is uh, Cape Hopewell. Some of you may know the, the famous flower pot rocks. Uh, and we experienced the, uh, the, the high tides, which is really quite amazing because there's nowhere else in the world that the tides are affected quite as strongly in the high tides here in the Bay of Fundy. So it was Canada Day, so I thought I'd take this shot here. Uh, this is the pier where we got on the boat, and you can see the effect of, of these high tides. This is just incredible, and it doesn't even show all of it because we were way down here getting on the boat, so... Uh, they have these big tall piers because they need it because the tide is extremely high. And there's uh, Peter and a pirate. And I actually managed to get a couple of shots of the whale. It wasn't easy. Um, he, on the boat, everybody seemed to be on one side and I was always on the other. And they'd say, there it is, and I'd be on the wrong side. And then I'd run to the other side and they'd say, there it is, and I'd be on the other side and I'd run to the other side. And, but I did manage to catch a couple of shots of the whales. And these were black minke whales, uh, really big guys, and uh, they gave us a nice show. And um, there's also seal there. Uh, it, was it was really neat to see the wildlife. We saw some uh, bald eagles as well, and porpoises, lots of porpoises. And these are not the dolphin type, but the fish type that jumped together and two at a time. It was really, really fun, really great time. Uh, the next day we went down to the Cape Hopewell at the uh, flower pot rock. So you can see, it looks like a flower pot. The, these uh, trees grew up uh, up here. Um, this, I, I took this picture when we first arrived. This was at the extreme low tide. Uh, it, it's about a six hour, it varies every day, but a six hour difference between high tide and low tide. So we played around on the, uh, on the ocean floor for a while, and then we all got in a bus and we went up to a place called Alma where we had some uh, incredible seafood lunch. Um, everybody else went back to see the high tide, which here, you, look at the difference here. You can kayak around there and there's caves in there. So it's a really, really neat place to be. This is an old picture I took a long time ago. But uh, instead, Peter and I decided to... Uh, um, well, here, first of all, here we are walking around on the ocean floor, and uh, not very many Ottawa members were there, but not bad. I think Rick Wagner in the back there, Chuck O'Dell was there. Barry, is Barry here tonight? Not here tonight. Uh, Barry Matthews and his wife Cecilia, and uh, me and Peter. And I don't know if anybody else from Ottawa was there, but uh, if they were, I, I didn't know about it. But there was a few of us. And uh, a really good time. So Peter and I, we kind of escaped the group, and we, we wanted to do some photography and check out the countryside. We found this gorgeous beach here that we walked along. Nobody on it, just maybe one jogger. And um, I, we're, we're rock hounds, so we found all these rocks because of the beach and the tides and the, and the surf. These are very highly polished rocks, and they're agates, and they're, they're like gems. So here we were filling our pockets with rocks, and. And we're going through the security at the airport, and the guy picks up the bag and says, what do you got in here, rocks? And I said, well, as, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so gorgeous, scene, whoops, gorgeous scenery with the horses there. So one of the best things, of course, is the food, the lobster. You can't go to New Brunswick without having lobster. And they spoiled us. Uh, every every um, GA, there's a, a special night. It's kind of a casual night. They call it barbecue. This was the, uh, the lobster fest night. And uh, we, we had a really, really great time stuffed ourselves. Uh, Peter found a live one here. <laughs> um, I put this one up for Marie's benefit. That's Peter's daughter. I'll, I'll email it to you later. Uh, the guy on the beside Peter here, I don't some of you might recognize him. He's Professor René Doyon uh, from McGill University. Last uh, annual dinner he gave a, a fantastic talk on, he's on a science team of uh, discovering all the extrasolar planets that is a bit of an explosion of it right now. And he gave the public lecture, the Helen Sawyer Hogg public lecture um, at the GA. And it, it, he just said, since then, so much has happened. So many more planets have been discovered. These are around other stars, not around our solar system, but other solar systems. So they're, and using adaptive optics, just like what, uh, what Al just showed you. It's a really, really incredible talk he gave. And just to give you an idea of how many people went to this, there are people all the way from Victoria and all the you know, Maritimes and Ontario and 
everywhere. It was about 150 people showed up at this J GA. And I thought that was a really, really good turnout. Um, we had a lunch with David Levy. He gave a great talk on the moon, the, it, more of a, the human side of the moon with, in literature and poetry and, and how it affects all of us. And it was a really, really great time. One of the best presentations it was a group of kids, uh, the Miramichi Star Troopers, who had raised $50,000. This is a rural area in New Brunswick. And they built an observatory with the help of their teacher, who was a, a really amazing person, too. And they, they bought Dobsonians, and they bought uh, Cassegrains, and they've got binoculars. And they, they set up a program that they want to share how they did this with all other schools across Canada. These kids are all expert public speakers. They, they put on such a fantastic show. And um, Jim Hesser is our honorary president. Uh, the, the national president talked about beyond the International Year of Astronomy. That was a very good talk. Our, our banquet speaker was Roy Bishop, who, who you, you should know, being in the RESC. Uh, he talked about the effects of the tide, the moon on the tides, but also a lot of the myths that go why people think that the tides are so high there in the Bay of Fundy. And most people, even the guides that gave the tour at, on the, the Hopewell, Cape Hopewell, was wrong. And he explained why, and it's all got to do with resonance. Out there in the ocean, there's a, there's a, a, a shelf like a continental shelf that brings the water in and, and creates, sets up the resonance that causes the tides to be so high. And also the effect, of course, the moon and the sun and the earth and the configuration, for example, when I think it's uh, when the moon is full and when the moon is new, uh, there's a, the combined gravitational pull on, on, on the water on the earth. It's like it's sloshing about and it's higher. But when the moon is on a, a quarter moon or a first quarter moon or a third quarter moon, it's much, much lower. It's not quite as uh, drastic. And when I was a kid, we used to have to really be careful about the tides. We would listen to the radio and listen to the news and hear the time and you'd hear the tides at the same time. So you always were aware when the tides were going to be. And of course, we would try to tempt Mother Nature and, and uh, stay out as long as we could until we were forced in from the tides. But uh, we also knew when it was neat tide or spring tide, because that really made a big difference whether you're going to make it or not. Uh, these are all the presenters. Um, not all of them. You can't see Renee and I think a couple of others that gave some really great talks. Um, I'm in the middle there. I actually gave a talk on image processing, more of a philosophy, which I'll probably give here one night. And Paul Gray was the GA chair, and uh, <laughs> he was a lot of fun. And you can see him here. I know how that feels. He, at the end of the GA, the, the GA chair and all the volunteers, they just want to party and just relax. And here he was having a great time. This was the last night when everything was over. And I said, I sympathize. I understand. And you're going to need about a week to recover. Um, there's always the turning over of the president. Uh, David Lane, who's been the president for the past two years, um, when he became president, Mary Lou Whitehorn gave him this voodoo doll. Uh, the RESC voodoo doll for when things get really tough. And um, so now she's the president, so he gave the voodoo doll back to her. <laughs> so Mary Lou is the only the fourth female president in the RESC uh, since uh, ever. So I thought, I thought that was really awesome. Next year is going to be in Winnipeg, and uh, I've never been there. And uh, I hope uh, a bunch of you will come and join us, and it's always a good time. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, and last up here this evening, uh, Chuck O'Dale is going to come and show us just a few slides, and then we'll pack her in for the night. Just start with, yeah, right here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we're late, so I'll just forego the uh, crater talk for tonight, but I just want to show you a couple of things. Uh, first of all, that's my uh, GA picture. That's my bird at the Fredericton Airport. Um, how many guys uh, remember we had an earthquake just a little while ago? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you, it scared the bejeepers out of me. Um, next one. Uh, my daughter and I uh, went up uh, and I did a scientific expedition to uh, uh, ground zero of where the earthquake was, and this is what we found. Next one. That is a landslide. That's uh, about, f oh, about 40 kilometers northeast of the Gatineau Airport. Just uh, flick through the next couple. I just uh... Now, this is a major one. Like it's a, uh, we have a clay base here, and it was so unstable, 
poof, it just, just went. Kapoof. So and that's, the guy lost his farm? No. The, the, where the guy lost his farm was before the earthquake. But it was the same kind of soil. And um, just up by the First Nation uh, River, on this side of the river, uh, you know, but a, while, a long while ago, there's another major landslide. Same kind of thing like this. But um, I just want to show you guys tonight, because uh, the earthquake was fairly recent. But uh, you can see how much energy it takes to move that stuff. But uh, the trees were uh, uprooted, the whole works. It was uh, quite substantial. Anyway, I just want to show you that, and I'll show you the crater some other time. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say, Chuck's been very accommodating tonight. We had him lined up for, uh, for a full talk, but we did run a little long tonight. So we're going to cut that off, and we'll, uh, we'll line him up for next time, perhaps. Uh, just a last few uh, things to mention before we wrap it up for the night. First of all, there's a uh, star party scheduled for uh, the Carp Library, Diefenbunker, whatever you like to call it, uh, planned for tomorrow night. Of course, contingent on there being the appropriate kind of skies. We're not sure yet. I think keep an eye on the member list, uh, RASP mem list, uh, for uh, an announcement, but you'll probably be able to look out the window and kind of decide for yourself. Uh, is there uh, a uh, alternate night, Chris? Do you know? I don't believe no, this one has a rain date. Okay. Uh, what was that? No, not, not for this one. Okay. But, uh, but also, the first time viewers or members can also go on our website. Okay. And it'll be a go or no go on the website. Oh, very good. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Emails. Yeah. Okay. Very helpful. So, uh, you all know how to find our website, I assume. If you don't, rasp.ca and then follow it to the Ottawa Centre. Uh, anyway, uh, the call will be made tomorrow. It's uh, just off of Carp Road uh, uh, in Carp, of course. I guess everybody knows where the Diefenbunker is. If not, follow the signs. You'll find it. It's fairly easy to find. 8.30 till 1 a.m. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the uh, Sky Tools 3 uh, discs are here. I think pretty much everyone has picked theirs up already. Uh, Chris may have one or two left that haven't been picked up. But uh, I'm so excited. I'm going to go home and play with it right away. Uh, next up, uh, after the meeting, uh, as usual, will the, uh, is it still here? Just went out. Okay, so the book library will be open. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, please do. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, free to uh, borrow for any of the members. Hey, that's a member benefit, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Uh, the, so the next one. <laughs> Al Scott's here, uh, Equipment Loan Library. So again, uh, benefit of membership. If you're a member, you can uh, borrow uh, a telescope. Was there a comment there quickly? No? Okay. Uh, Coffee and Conversation outside, Art and Fraser in the uh, common area. Membership info, you can talk to Art if you need to know anything uh, about membership. Uh, cards, if uh, yours is due to be here, Art will have it. Uh, you can see Stephen McIntyre regarding uh, cut rate magazine subscriptions to the major publications. Please remember the rest of the museum is closed, so stay to the, uh, the common area out the front. Please don't go wandering in the museum. Uh, and the usual reservation has been made over at Kelsey's, so you can uh, come over and join the group over there for snacks, drinks, dinner, whatever you like. Uh, next meeting. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip that one there. Okay. Uh, in the audience, 114 tonight, down a little bit from uh, our, uh, our biggest meetings, but then this time of year, that's not surprising. A lot of people are off on vacation, that sort of thing. Uh, many thanks to the organizers and speakers, all of whom are, are listed here. Uh, thanks to our host, uh, Canadian Science and Technology Museum. Without their, uh, their kind... Uh, uh, offer of the auditorium here. We wouldn't have a place to meet. And uh, please send any complaints, comments, suggestions, that sort of thing to me at my e email address there, uh, bill.wagstaff at rogers.com. Next, please. Next meeting, 8 o'clock, uh, Friday, August 6th. So we're back to first Friday of the month uh, in August. And the following one, September, just so you know, we're, uh, we're moving it to the second Friday because, of course, Labor Day weekend gets in the way. We don't want to mess with long weekends, right? We all like to be out of town. 
Okay, thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure. Have a safe drive home, please.